the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. Now thousands gathered around the disciples who were being filled with the Holy Spirit, and the crowd began to ask questions. Acts 2, 5 to 17 says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now the reason why they were there, they were there for that day of Pentecost, that celebration feast, which is 50 days after Passover. Jesus died on the Passover. He's in the grave for three days. He showed himself alive with many infallible or irrevocable proofs for 40 days. So seven days later, after Jesus ascends into heaven, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, shows us that he pours out his spirit. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews and men that are proselytes and women that are proselytes there. And they hear this sound occurring, verse 6, and when the sound occurred, the multitude, thousands, came together and were confused because everyone heard them these Galileans speak in his own language. Verse 7, Then they were all amazed, and they marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So these are people not born in Jerusalem or born in Galilee. They were born in other countries. And then it gives a description, a list of places. Parthians and Medes and Elamites those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. So after giving the list, it goes back to what they're saying. We hear them speaking in our own tongues or, or languages the wonderful works of God. So they're amazed. I'm from a different country. I come here. These are Galileans. How can they be knowing my language? I grew up speaking this language. So they were all amazed and perplexed, confused, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocked. They made fun. And they said, they're full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it's but only the third hour of the day. This is about nine o'clock in the morning. Verse 16, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Notice, he says, 
in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We're around 2,000 years removed from that day. So we're still in the last days. This promise is still available. Notice that when this took place, people from every nation under heaven, the scripture said, came together and heard the Galileans speaking languages that people in the crowd had learned growing up in their nations outside of Israel. And these crowds were amazed. Why? Because Galilee was known to be a very simple, non-academic region. And people who came from Galilee would not have been trained to speak in all these languages. They didn't have schools and all these places to go to. Some of the apostles from Galilee, later on in Scripture, in the book of Acts, are even called by schooled men. They're called to be men that were unlearned and ignorant. Notice the crowd states, we hear them speaking in our own languages, the wonderful works of God. Whatever could this mean? I would like to give you a personal experience of this happening. My grandmother, who lived in Los Angeles, California at that time, was praying with others around the front and speaking in tongues after church service. And afterwards, a Spanish-speaking woman from Mexico came up to her and began to speak in Spanish. When this woman realized that my grandmother did not understand Spanish, she had her son interpret for her. My grandmother was told that while speaking in tongues, she was speaking about the wonderful works of God. My grandmother was speaking in perfect Spanish, and in Spanish was describing heaven, as if my grandmother was standing in heaven and looking around. That is indeed the power of God taking place in a person's life, just like the book of Acts. Some time ago, while I was preaching at a church in Japan, there were moments that I would stop preaching, and I would just stand there and worship God. Sometimes I would lay down my microphone and just stand there and worship God, sometimes speaking with tongues, not personally understanding what I said, and after the service, the Japanese interpreter told me that it was during those times of speaking with tongues, she told me that I was actually speaking in Japanese. I do not speak, nor do I understand the Japanese language. Why did and why do these things continue to happen? Because the Bible is real. This Bible is truth. And this promise is for you and for everyone who will receive it in faith. Lord, we just ask you right now that you would lose faith, that you would give to us understanding, Lord, that this promise is available to us, that we might receive it. Lord, some for the first time, some it's been a long time, but right now, Lord, let your power, let the power of your Holy Spirit come down. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Now, going back to the first time God gave this promise to people in Acts chapter 2, Peter tells the thousands gathered that Jesus, whom they crucified just 50 days earlier, was pouring out this gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to read Acts 2, 37 to 39, but before we do, can you feel that? That's here because we prayed. God is speaking to you and He's with you. May the Lord bless you through the remainder of this Bible study. Let's go back. Acts 2, 37 to 39. It says, Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Felt guilt. Because they knew they had crucified. Just 50 days earlier, thousands of people had shouted, Crucify Him, crucify Him. As Jesus made His way to Golgotha. And when they heard that they were part of that crowd and that they were part of sending him there, this wonderful Jesus, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were expecting the wrath of God to hit them. They didn't know what exactly was to happen to them personally. They just knew the judgments of God was going to hit them. Some people call it conviction. When the, when the preacher speaks or the preacher reveals things from the Word and people feel in their heart uncomfortable, what do we do? We do the same thing that Peter said to them to do. First, we repent. Verse 38. 
And let every one of us, or you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. Remission means to wash. We talked about this in Lesson 7. If you haven't watched those uh, videos yet, I, I recommend that you, if you have time, please go through that. You be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the washing or remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So Peter's preaching reveals that this promise is for absolutely everyone. Some translations reveal that afar off means the Gentiles, and God is calling everyone. God hasn't stopped calling people into his plan of salvation. Therefore, God is still giving the same baptism of the Spirit with the same evidence of speaking in a different language. That is tremendously wonderful to know that we can experience this promise. It's more than head knowledge. It's something that we can receive today.